Good day, Grade Twelves. My name is Kaden Mazokere. I'm the author and publisher of the Distinction Bound Student Textbooks, and welcome to Exam Prep November 2020 Paper One. Right, let's get uh, into it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go through the whole question paper uh, from Section A to Section B to Section C, and we are going to um, work with the assumption that a learner is going to follow the, the the topics that i recommend okay so for paper one we have two modules we have uh, macroeconomics and then we have uh, what do you call this one uh e economic pursuits now we we are doing i'm doing this video in 2021 and two weeks ago we received a new examination guidelines and from that uh there are some changes and one of them like the major change is that uh, protectionism and free trade was moved to uh, economic pursuits so in this paper it was if there's a question on protectionism and free trade it's going to be appearing from macroeconomics because in the previous exam guidelines the topic protectionism and free trade was uh, under macroeconomics so any question you see for for that was macro but from now on from 2021 uh, the topic will the, is now moved to economic pursuits i hope that's clear okay so don't be surprised okay but now as i talk about it any question i see for protectionism and free trade i'm going to regard it as economic pursuits yeah because i'm doing the video after the change so yeah it will make sense for me to address it that way okay let's get down so we start with section a so section a as you can see it's 16 marks and uh for a learner to pass at least to pass to get that 30 percent the learner must get uh at least 45. so multiple choice is very very important in that sense now one of the things i mentioned when i was doing exam prep multiple choice uh, which i can point out now in case you didn't watch that um that video okay quickly uh as for our multiple choice questions we have it will be two a's okay it doesn't mean this is where they should be there will be two b's there will be two c's and two d's okay so how is this useful let's say these are the ones you know and questions three and seven you don't know but you know that the answer is either c or d for question three and for question seven so what i recommend then is go through question three once again <clears throat> and see if which of the two makes more sense because sometimes the answer might seem to be a b uh, a b c and maybe you know you can see that d is obviously wrong let's say now in that case uh, what i can recommend then is if d looks ex wrong 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 then this then becomes c then automatically this becomes d like that or the other way around maybe number three is the one that is d and number seven is the one that is c but all you need to know is there will always be two a's two b's two c's and two d's and they started with this uh, with this um system in 2017 okay so it's been years since they've been doing this check memos of past papers if you want as i'm going through this i'm following exactly how it was and uh when i say the answer is a just put it somewhere when i'm done with these eight questions you will see that we'll, at the end of the day we are going to have two a's two b's and two d's so it's important that you know that okay let's get down to it the other thing i recommend for multiple choice is that you read the question and you answer the question in your head and then after answering you then uh, look for your answer from the options so in most cases if the answer is in your head there is a good chance that your answer is correct okay All right let's look at number one the value in the the difference in the value of the output okay uh, at the peak 
and the value of output at the trough. So what we are talking about is something like this. So we have business cycles, okay? I'll just sketch it. So then we have a trend line and then we have this being, okay, let me change my pen. This here being our, what, length, okay? And this here, this here being our trough. So let's go to the question. The difference in the value of the output at the peak. So where is that? This is a peak here. So the, this output, look, 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 look. So this output, whatever number it is here, this output and the value of the output at the trough. So where is our trough? I'm coming to this period here. So it will be this output here, whatever figure it is of a business cycle is known as. So what is this vertical distance here between a peak and a trough? Which peak, uh, which peak, this one, which trough, this one, even if I pick a different one, I'm going to say, okay, the output will be here. This will be my peak and this will be my trough. So it will be this part here. Uh, and I'm sure you can already tell what this is. We know this is a length. This is a trend line. And this here is recession. This is depression. This is a trough. This is a peak. This is a recovery. This is prosperity. So you can see what's missing here. So what's missing is an amplitude. So our answer will be number will be C. So try to use that kind of trick to uh, see the keywords in uh, in a question. So our keywords in this particular question are these trough and peak. And also the, the word difference is key as well. So please take note. Let's go to number two. One of the member countries um, of the BRICS protocol is, so of course you have to look at the answers. Now, what you are looking for is Brazil. You are looking for Russia. You are looking for India. You are looking for China. You are looking for South Africa. Any one of these must be there. Okay, I don't know which ones, but any one of them must be there. If there's Brazil, that's the answer. If Russia is there, now it can never be two of these days like it can never be a brazil to russia c india d china if that's the case then the answer is all of the above and so i ended with d so there's no answer all of them but if maybe we say brazil russia india and then d we make it all of the above then the answer would be d so let's find out okay we have china so Japan is not there. You see, England is not there. It Italy, yes. This one can be tricky because if you look at it, you think it's the eye, but the eye is for India. And if I had set this paper, I would make it uh, tricky as well. I'll try to look for a country that starts with a B. I'll put Botswana there. Then I'll look for a country that starts with uh, R, which is not Russia. I'm not thinking of any right now, but I'll think until I find it, then I'll put that just to confuse. And I'll probably put it in that order. B, R, I, C, like that. And maybe make C the answer, China. So I'll put China on C. If I had said this, I'll try to make it a bit more confusing because this is sort of giving it away because, uh, the answer is either C or I. So yeah, some will say it's C, but those who got it wrong, mm, they are not picking up the clues. Okay. The next one, if the marginal propensity to consume the MPC, the MPC, what we know is that MPC plus MPS is equal to one. Okay. So if we are given any one of these two, we simply say one minus whatever that is. So we are saying here one minus 0 0.6. So one minus 0 0.6 is equal to 0 0.4. So our answer here will be 
look for 0 0.4 that's d okay the next question which one of the following is presented in october okay uh two things that we can talk about in october first we have the medium term expenditure framework now this is where it matters that you know the difference and the other one is the medium term budget policy statement now this one here is a is a three-year rolling budget basically if i want to summarize it and this one is basically the one that is being uh, explained here it informs parliament of the changes that have been made to the budget uh, or the changes in the budget since february now uh, if someone is asking what kind of changes well if you look at um the budget speech in south africa is presented in february and it's presented for the coming fiscal year which is going to run okay i'm saying which is going to because i'm assuming we are in february and we are presenting that budget speech ne? which is going to be presented in um what do you call it in which is going to be used from the first of april until the 31st of march the following year and then just like last year 2020 a budget speech was presented and uh it was finalized and then it was published and everyone knew what the changes were uh and then yeah we started making use of that budget so spending by the south african government it was spending according to the budget and then something happened we all know what happened in 2020 around march uh, covid was uh, declared as a pandemic so for that reason uh we had to what do you call it uh we we had to adjust the budget and start uh catering for the the, the new thing that had come so that will be um informed to the parliament in october in the medium term budget policy statement so that's where you should know the difference so in this case uh putting medium term expenditure framework would confuse now if you say the answer is a you are far from the answer okay because this one here is presented in feb and if you say the answer is is d uh, i would say d is a because the national budget is the main budget i would say so this again is feb but this is one thing that is being said here in different ways okay and these two are different and the difference is what i just said so in that case one year they'll change it and say maybe put the same answers but now change the statement in the question and ask which one of the following is presented in october as a three-year rolling budget for the country the answer in that case then would be the medium term expenditure framework so in this case the answer then is b is the medium term budget policy statement the next question long-term uh deposits of the uh, domestic sector at monetary institutions are part of the dash money supply okay your answer is either m1 m2 or m3 there is no m4 okay so if we look at what we have here what is m1 well m1 involves coins you see we have coins in in this country and you know what they are we have the five cent i don't think people use it no more and we have the 10 cents and we have 20 cents 50 cents one rand two rand and five rand so the the minting of those coins that will be involved in m1 the number two, no, not M2, but the other thing will be the notes, the bank notes, the printing of the, the 10 rand, the 20, the 50, the 100, and the 200. So those five, <coughs> five different notes and demand deposit. So that is our M1. Then M2 is M1 plus. So if I say it's M1, I mean it's coins, it's notes, it's demand deposits plus all other short-term uh, and medium-term deposits then the third one which is the final one is m3 and m3 is m2 
so everything i said on m2 is m3 plus all long-term deposits okay so our answer here will be we go back <coughs> it says long-term deposits so our answer is because uh, here it's short term here it's demand deposit here it's short actually short and medium so the answer there will be m3 for that reason long-term deposits the next question a supply reason for international trade is <clears throat> now you have to have them in your head supply reasons basically are reasons or things that make us trade with other countries uh not because of our willingness but maybe more because of um what nature provided let me try to put it that way uh things that we are mostly not in control of let me put it that way okay here's an example if we look at something like uh what what can i say um international migration for instance that one is a demand reason okay let me explain i'm from zimbabwe and i am living in south africa so i have migrated from my country and now there are things that i grew up eating that i'm going to demand here in south africa but those things are not found in south africa they are found in zimbabwe so i'm going to look for them and <clears throat> as many of us come to south africa uh people are going to realize that there is a demand for certain goods from zimbabwe and then those goods will be imported from zimbabwe to south africa and the reason why that's happening in that case is international migration so we are demanding things because we migrated so basically that will be a demand reason a supply reason on the other hand will be something like this okay we are in south africa god gave us gold here in south africa so if we sell gold to other countries it becomes a supply reason because uh we are actually not in control with that i don't know if that's a good example that i gave but i hope it is and if it's not clear uh we have a comment section down below put your comment there and ask for clarity if you think it's not that clear so let's look out for things that seem to be supply reasons income level that is a demand reason consumer preference and taste that is a demand reason because the consumer is saying no i don't like this i like that so if what the consumer likes is made in a foreign country then uh the, those th there's going to be demand for those things <clears throat> Uh, that consumers in South Africa prefer. So that becomes a demand reason, right? The size of the population. And then the last one is the labor resources. Well, the answer would be D in this case, labor resources. But I normally say it as labor resources are unevenly distributed. Okay, I would say that's a supply reason. Okay. Then an interest rate that commercial banks offer their most valued clients uh, is called the, okay, the, uh, I think you'd expect to see uh, in your options, repo rate. Okay, if it's there, it's obviously wrong. And you'd expect prime rate, which is also called a prime lending rate. Any one of the two will be correct, but repo rate is wrong. I, I don't know what else is there okay prime is there uh we don't have to waste time that's the answer i see here fixed rates i see preference rates uh preference rates would be confusing in a way because someone is going to look at look interest rate that commercial banks offer their most valued clients so it probably means that they prefer those so someone would put it for that reason okay be careful which one of the following is classified as excise duty? Well, mostly it will be alcohol, it will be cigarettes, it will be so look out for a demerit good there. If there's something that is a merit good or anything other than that, than a demerit good, I uh, no. Okay, tax on alcohol. <clears throat> a gun license, uh, that wouldn't be okay guns may be seen as uh bad things let's say uh they may trigger violence and so on but in this case if someone goes and gets it and licenses uh it it's more mainly for protection so uh it's it's not a bad thing 
Okay, the other one is value added tax, no. Personal income tax, no. So the answer then that we are looking for is tax on alcohol. Okay, the next one. Okay, so this concludes. If you did, if you were writing down your answers, you will see that we have two A's, two B's, and two D's, uh, as I said earlier. Okay, let's go to column A and B. With column A and B, my strategy is I don't look at the answers, just so this is the same strategy that I use for multiple choice. <clears throat> and I find it easy this way instead of reading, because if you read the question, the, the answer, because the answer here is the term. Okay, if you read, let's say, the term autonomous consumption, you're going to read A, you read that sentence, you see, no, it's not. You read B, you read, no, it's not. You read D, no, it's not. You're looking for something that matches with autonomous consumption. I think you will be wasting time. Then when you're done, when you finally find it, let's say on H, after reading all those things and saying no, 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 then you say number two, new economic paradigm. A, no, it's not. B, no, it's not. Then you find the answer on, on, on H down there. So I think you'll be wasting time. So personally, this is how I do it. I go to column B. I ignore what is written on in column A. Then I look for the answer in my head. Okay. So i would say something like this. i would say, um, let's say the, the owner of the factors of production, um, the owner of the factor of production in the country, that will be households. So if it's households, then I look here. So in this case, you see, there's nothing like that. So it's wrong. So this is the, the this is our dummy in this uh, column A and B. It's not applicable to any of the terms there. I'm looking for households. I don't see it. If it wasn't there, like it isn't there, I would probably say maybe they put consumer. And then I noticed that no, consumer is also not there. So since it's not there, um, then I'll skip. So A is not one of the answers. Let me read again. The owners of the factors of production in the economy, households, I don't see it, so it's gone. Then B, you see, there's nothing. B, coordinates government actions to increase the competitiveness of South African businesses. Well, this sounds like integrated manufacturing strategy. So our B is gone, so then we take it out scratch so i call this the elimination method so we are taking them one by one okay then number three number c uh focus on the acquisition of skills that will be uh gypsa i'd say c gypsa yes the next one number d spending that takes place irrespective of the level of income this is autonomous so that will be 2.1.1 autonomous the next one uh the smoothing of business cycles using monetary and fiscal policy that is the new economic paradigm yes e is gone new economic paradigm the next one ensures the supply of standardized articles through an automated me uh, mechanical process that will be mass production f yes mass production the next one increase in a country's production capacity this is economic growth so there, this will go to seven and wow i've never seen it this way that a, num a number is corresponding with you know the the, the letter like this uh, normally they would try to cross them crisscross them like that ne? i've noticed but i've never seen it like this so it doesn't mean if they are next to each other, they cannot be correct. In this case, G goes with number seven and G is the seventh letter on the alphabet. So uh, don't use that skill to say, no, they can't match them, but here they do match and it's the answer. The next one, official rules and regulation that can hinder service delivery. This is bureaucracy can't be anything else so i becomes obvious i is dumping even if you, you haven't read that but reading it will just confirm 
selling goods in another country you see at a very low price uh, with which the local industry cannot compete this is dumping for sure all right so this is how i do my column a and b okay let's move on to 1.3 now 1.3 is one of the toughest uh parts of section a it is the toughest part of section a if also not one of the toughest in the entire question paper because uh they ask you questions and they don't give you uh a clue so you have to know economic terminology for you to do well here right the labor force between the age of 15 and 65 uh, that is willing and able to work this is economically active population it illustrates and it's a it's an economic indicator take note uh it illustrates and yeah sorry i'm back to that one and it's coming under employment okay so we have employment indicators eap then the people willing and able so we have people aged between 15 and 65 who are not willing so they are not part of the economically active population if someone says labor force here uh i i wouldn't think they are wrong okay so the answer here is eap is the most appropriate but if labor force was given by a learner personally i think i would mark that learner right it illustrates or shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation uh, if you are not careful here you are going to write laffer curve okay it's actually the phillips curve if you are not curve careful all right let me show you the difference if you see something like this this will be the laffer curve it shows the the, the relationship so what could confuse a learner is the part relationship but now is the relationship between tax rate and tax revenue so here we have the tax revenue and here we have the tax rate okay so from zero to hundred percent this here has to be hundred percent then 50 somewhere in between then the, the the revenue can just make up some numbers in billions of rands most mostly now the one that they are asking here looks like this yes it looks like this so don't confuse them uh but at least if you know it's either a phillips or laffer curve you are not that far but yes it's the phillips curve the next one a form of credit from the international monetary fund uh, i'm always talking about this thing and i don't always see it in exams uh, and finally i'm seeing it here uh, which can be used when balance of payment um, difficulties are experienced well the thing that is issued by the imf is um what <laughs> special drawings rights so sdr but now in some cases you would see it said as special rights drawings okay but i think this one is the most appropriate one so it's the special drawing rights not the special rights drawing okay in some i've seen it written as srd but personally i say sdr okay so well when a com country has a deficit on its uh, balance of payment, uh, there are so many ways in which those de the deficit can be corrected. So this here is one of the ways in which um, a country can make corrections on its BOP. So yeah, that's what the question is requiring here. But it's not the only, if the question was saying, uh, what are the various ways in which countries can make corrections of bop uh, deficits Th then you would mention this as one of them okay and one of them you could mention gold reserves you could mention foreign currency is one of the things that countries may have in reserve okay the next one a penalty imposed on one or more countries on another country by restricting trade well here i would say it's a sanction oh yeah we have other terms okay others a ban quarters not really quarters okay i'll go for sanctions the next one consultation between the south african reserve bank 
and uh, banks to persuade uh, them to act in a manner that is desirable. Okay, this one here is moral suasion. Now, in some cases, you see it also as moral persuasion. Uh, I, I think get, taking it from this word here to persuade, okay, it's a it's moral suasion, right? Uh, and and I'm not hundred percent sure about the way I'm pronouncing it. An increase in the number of people moving from rural areas to cities. This is urbanization. It can't be anything else. Okay, let's go to section B. So in section B, I recommend questions two and four. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to touch question three at all because it's economic pursuits and I don't recommend these. The ones I'm doing here are the ones that I say, look, uh, if you want to be my student, study this. But look, I'm not saying don't do economic pursuits because you will come across it in question four. So you can't totally run away from it. But I normally then say uh, don't answer question three. All right. The next one then is, as usual, this will be 2.1.1. Name any two sources of state revenue. Now, with this one, I want you to be careful because if you are not careful, you 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 may write uh, what do you call this one? You may write VAT, and then after that, you say company tax and so on. They're actually awarding all those as one mark. You see that tax, capital gains tax, uh, value added tax, customs duties. All these are given one mark so you want to think of other ways in which besides tax other ways in which government can make money so tax is given here as one one mark so you know most that government has state on entity so government can make profit from that and you know that they could sell those state on entities and that process is called uh, privatization so they can make money from that so think of other ways in which government makes money besides tax because if you say value added tax companies tax then you will only be given one mark okay income from property rental yes government has many buildings that they are not using so they can rent the property and make money from that the next one will be income from privatization of state assets that's what i mentioned also uh, profits from state-owned entities like ESCOM, if they ever make profits, which is quite rare. And then donations. Yes, government can get money from donations and government can also borrow money from other institutions, other countries, by institutions, mostly the World Bank and the IMF as well, the International Monetary Fund. All right, next question. This one will be one point, no, two point two. 2.1.2 ah, 2. okay what is the purpose of residual item when the expenditure method is used to calculate gdp well residual item is there to deal with any omissions or error yeah like you see here the residual item takes into account errors and omissions that may have occurred in order to balance the gdp and gdi equation Right, then we have uh, data response and data response is 10 marks. If you see what you see here, you see only four marks is because I could not fit it on one page on one slide. So the, uh, it's going to continue on the next slide. All right. So the instruction would say, read the extract below and answer the questions that follow the public sector, which is the state, which is the government. Okay. <clears throat> the public sector comprises three levels, namely national, provincial, and local government. But uh, we normally say it consists of four. And after these, we then add state-owned entities. All right, so it's, it consists of those four, but here it says three. Right, the government programs include the medium-term strategic framework implemented from 2014 to 2019, as part of the National Development Plan, NDP. Okay, this already sounds like um, 
NTP. It already sounds like, what do you call this? Uh, economic pursuits. But, well, we're talking about the public sector. So then that will be topic number three, then which becomes then macroeconomics. Right. It consists of various focus areas such as education, health, and, econo uh, and economic growth and development. So which level of the government develop, develops policy and coordinates service across all nine provinces? That would be easy. The national government. And we also call it the central government. Yes. Name one macroeconomic objective. Okay. This one I told you I've always been saying it. We have this term here, which I just created. Okay. So it's IFEPE. So E, that will be economic growth. F, that will be full employment. E, that's uh, exchange rate stability. P, that's price stability. And here it's economic equity. So you can say any one of them. Okay, there they are. The next one, briefly describe the term accountability. Well, this term accountability basically uh, you want to talk about uh, someone being responsible for whatever actions they uh, and also being able to give that feedback and uh, also if if something goes wrong then you must be able also to take responsibility of your actions so normally uh, look the budget speech is presented and the minister of finance is talking about billions and billions of rands and so that money will eventually be handed over to different ministries. And then those ministries have to manage that money uh, in ways that they can account for and say, yes, minister, you gave us 40 billion and this is how we used it and so on and so on. So basically that is what you want to talk about. Okay, the duty of an individual or organization, but in this case, in most cases, it will be an organization or a department, but also an individual, like uh, the ones that become corrupt are the ones that will have been handed the money to. Okay, so or organization to explain its decisions, like this is what we decided to do with the money that you gave us, uh, honorable minister, and this is what we did, here is the proof and all that and actions and accept responsibility for its behavior. So that is being accountable, right? The next part of our 10 mark data response, as you can see, like I said, yes. How will the government benefit from privatizing state owned entities? Well, privatization is, I said it earlier, is when the state sells uh, a state owned entity uh, either the whole entity or part of the entity to a point that um, it sells more than 50% of its ownership in that company. So that is what privatization is. Now, what are the benefits? Well, what you want to be thinking about is number one, if government sells the state owned entity, first and foremost, they make money from selling it just that. Then number two, after selling the company, that company is now private. So the company has to now pay tax. So again, government will make money. So government will make money selling the state owned entity. Number two, it will make money taxing that new uh, company, which is no longer state owned. And number three, you also want to talk about uh, reduction of the burden uh, that government has you you notice that in most cases these state-owned entities are inefficient so now time and again they need to be uh bailed out so all that stuff is what you should be thinking about okay now this is just too much so any of the things i was saying here uh, is what you could just say and get your two marks. Okay, generate additional revenue or additional funds for the government to provide more goods and services. The tax base will be broadened because this new company has to pay tax, like I said. The next point, 
it can lead to greater efficiency i also mentioned the fact that state-owned entities are mostly inefficient and one of the reasons they become inefficient is because they um they are aware that they can get away with the inefficiency through bailouts now if it's a company it goes bankrupt and that's the end but with state-owned entities they can be inefficient and they'll survive because government is going to bail them out because it's their baby okay the government can use privatization to promote broad-based black economic empowerment right next one which is uh for four marks and this is the last question on our data response why is the pricing policy a problem okay so as government makes provision of public goods and services there are many many pro problems that uh, arise and i normally call it papape uh, like this so each one here stands for something this will be privatization this is uh the problem of assessing needs these are parastatals this is accountability this is the pricing policy and this is uh efficiency so with p this is the p that they are asking about the pricing policy why is it a problem well i'd say think about something around these lines government has to make provision of goods and services yes government has to uh, worry about the social well-being of its citizens and now one of the challenges that government may face is i always use the example of water government has to make sure that everyone has access to drink safe um to, to to safe drinking water okay i said it the other way around well so if that's the case some uh people are poverty stricken so they may not afford the, the 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 water that is clean and safe to drink so uh government then has uh, a, a challenge there okay should we give them water for free the problem with that is people become wasteful okay number two uh the other side of things is this if they charge the real price some people will not be able to afford it but it's one of the basic human rights or you know like yes you have the right to drink to to drink water so if now you cannot afford the water then it's more like you are being deprived of that right in a way okay so then government doesn't know how much to charge for the water and government is not using the forces of demand and supply and so that is where the challenge comes so you want to say something along those lines okay let's see what we have the state-owned enterprises do not work with uh within the market system of demand and supply creating problems in determining the price for goods and services i mentioned that community goods are provided free of charge because it is difficult to attach a price due to its non-excludability and non-rival characteristic yes you cannot exclude free riders from consuming public goods and services and one person's consumption does not diminish consumption by other people so it becomes a challenge as to how much to charge then user charges government loses income due to motorists failing to pay e-tolls leading to tax evasion and this is happening and uh, i'm sure you know so many culprits if you are not one of them uh, if the price of a product or service increases sharply it would lead to misallocation of resources for example water and electricity in this case the misallocation will be under supply when government considers covering the cost of a service with charge uh, with charges difficulties may arise when relatively high fixed costs are involved such as public rail or bus transport where direct and indirect subsidies would cover part of the cost so basically this is how pricing is a problem this is why pricing is one of the problems of public sector provisioning then uh 
we are done with question 2.2 10 marks so we're moving on to 2.3 and this again is 10 marks but if you look here we only have four so the other four the, the other word six will come from uh the next one or two slides right which item okay so let's study the table basically here we have a bop for 2018 and uh, lucky here we see that they tell you that you subtract this and those ones you add and so on and i see there's something missing and so normally if there's something missing they'll ask you what is missing we'll come to that and so on and so on okay then we see balance on the current account and uh there's a memo item missing as well which is trade balance so yes let's have a look now which item in the current account is unique to south africa well that would be this one here if you check the zimbabwe's bop it does not have net gold exports so then the question is why is it that south africa has it separate because what is net gold exports net gold export is simply one of the merchandise that we export so why is net gold not included as one of the merchandise that south africa exports well the answer is because of uh gold's importance to south africa so or, or should i say historical importance uh to south africa and south africa is one of the biggest if not the biggest exporters of gold okay so the answer to number one is oh what was the question again which item in the current account is unique okay so that's net gold exports the number two name the item a okay a is current transfers now what is that well current transfers is um one one thing i can mention is it's a net figure you see this one here that's why it says negative something the everything else is positive this positive that because these are not net figures okay so with this one something went out of the country something came into the country but what was it that was leaving the country and what was it that was coming into the country and then recorded on this item a well It'll be things like donations, it's things like uh, gifts, and so on. So basically with BOP, it's, it's coming in the topic international trade, where we had that question that says, uh, identify a supply reason for international trade. So international trade basically happens because of so many reasons. Some of them are demand, some of them are supply reasons. So we then have this thing called balance of payment, which is a systematic record of a country's transaction with the rest of the world so now this thing has to balance and if it doesn't balance we have ways to uh to to correct the the, the deficits and the most desirable imbalance will be a, a a surplus which is most unlikely anyway especially here in south africa so now every component here is specific as to what is this for what is this for merchandise exports this is all the things that we export net gold i talked about it service receipts this is the service that we render to other countries so we receive payment so this money came in let me do it like this so this money is uh merchandise exports sorry sorry sorry, sorry. yeah it's money that came in and net gold export yes we exported gold money came in service receipts yes we rendered a service to them and they paid income receipts yes south africans worked abroad and they were paid plus merchandise imports yes we bought things from other countries subtract money went out payments for service yes they rendered a service to us we paid for it income payments yes foreigners working in south africa getting paid income payments then now here what do we do we add or subtract depending on this figure here uh, depending on the sign so in this case it's a negative so what it simply means is <clears throat> uh, an example will be you 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 are south african and then you you go and study abroad or you go and work abroad and your family is still here in south africa now it's your birthday and you are in some country australia wherever it is that you are and it's your birthday and your mother sends you a gift 
to australia so we'll see goods leaving south africa for australia but nothing is coming in return to pay for it so it cannot be regarded as an export where that thing is not being exported that thing is being is just going and nothing is coming back in return at least at that time <clears throat> and then months later it's now your mother's birthday and you are still there and you remember that she bought you a present when it was your birthday so now you want to do the same then you buy your mother something maybe a car or anything and then you send it here to south africa and then they receive it here so we have goods leaving the country we have goods coming into the country and it cannot be recorded at one of these because these are exchanges this is these are more like uh, economic transactions but this one here is sort of a gift if you understand so current transfers is that the next one is briefly describe the term capital transfer account well it is a net amount it's this one here so here already you can see it's positive so it's net just as much as this one here is net the, the this one here just as much as it's net this one is also net so we have a positive on the capital transfer account but the question is what is it so it is a net account and includes all transactions that grant uh, rel uh, that and and grant sorry relating to the ownership of fixed assets so think of anything that is a fixed asset debt forgiveness and the value of household and personal effects and financial claims and liabilities of migrants so all that is uh, recorded on the capital transfer account and please take note of this and that and also this key term here as well okay the next one explain one factor that would influence demand to reduce the deficit in the balance of payment well what could reduce demand so here uh you you what could not reduce demand but what could influence demand to reduce the deficit so a deficit will happen if more money went out than money that came in so money goes out when we are due to these things here due to these things here money goes out and money comes in due to these things here so what do you think name any factor that would influence this maybe to be bigger and maybe this to be smaller but the key term is demand okay so here are some options an increase in the repo rate affects interest rates and leads to a decrease in import spending okay uh it can be arguable though government incentives are applied to substitute imports okay import controls tariffs and quotas reduce demand true certain exchange controls have been uh, retained by the central bank to ration foreign exchange and led to a decrease in the demand okay so those are the um, options that uh, we have there determine the value of trade balance so basically here you need to know the formula so to get trade balance we make use of merchandise exports here this one here merchandise exports we add this so basically it's what we exported so anything that says exports minus anything that says imports so we have three items here now these two here they are one because like i mentioned earlier gold is merchandise and and by merchandise we mean tangibles okay so merchandise exports net plus net gold exports minus merchandise imports so basically you look at these numbers here these two numbers you add them up you get one and one number and then you you subtract this number so basically it will be one one like that you see it's the same number that you saw in the table uh, we add that one and then we subtract this then that will give us that so our answer is 24 point 24 point 
uh, 3 million rands you can write it like that but uh, there's no need for you to round it off what I mean is this yes 24.3 million and take note you must see this now will you get a mark if you write it like this 24281 uh, you you should get it wrong because there's a difference between 24,281 and 24.3 million rands. This number, if we are to read it correctly, it's 24 billion rands. The reason I'm saying that is, uh, if we write it here, let, let me show you, it's 24, right? And then it's 281. And then it says M. You see this M here? It's coming from this millions here. So what is a million? A million is a number with one, two, three, four, five, six zeros. So the M is represented by these zeros, right? So now how many zeros do we have? Three plus three, that's six, plus three again, that's nine. So a number with nine zeros is 24.3 billion. But I don't want to confuse you. Don't worry about what I'm saying. But what I'm just saying is this number here is big. It's not 24 million. Million is too small. So, but 24.3 billion rands, that makes sense. Uh, are you telling me that South Africa exported gold worth 71,000? That's just one person they, uh, buying gold worth that much. But as a country, South Africa exported 71.7 billion rand worth of gold. That makes sense. Okay. The next one, briefly explain leading indicators and composite indicators as features underpinning forecasting of business cycles. Right, leading indicators well, these are things that will show us that the economy is going to do this. So they are leading. They happen a couple of months ahead. So anything that will tell us that a recession is coming, that thing is leading. Okay. So you want to talk about something along those lines. When these indicators rise, the level of economic activity will also rise. But you see, a few months later. So whatever this thing is, it's leading. It's months ahead. It's showing us that a recession is coming pr prior to it actually coming. It's telling us that this situation is going to turn around prior to the situation turning around. At that time, the situation, by the, by the situation I mean, <clears throat> this is what business cycles are, right? Ups and downs, right? Successive periods of fluctuations in economic activity. So our economy goes up and down. It doesn't grow up in a steady fashion. There are times when things improve or economic activity increases over time. There are times when it's negative. But in the long, in the long term, the general trend is that it goes up and down, but in an upward direction. So the general trend looks like this line that I just drew here. So leading indicators will then lead they'll tell us that a recession is coming way before the recession actually comes so a couple of months ahead leading indicators give customers or businesses the state or and the state a glimpse of the direction in which the economy is heading leading economic indicators are also important for investors uh, because they are used to predict the future of the economy, e.g. job ad advertising spaces, inventory and sales. Right. The next one is composite. Well, we have leading, lagging and composite indicator, uh, leading, lagging and coincident indicators. Those three are the main ones. Let's say uh, we use them to forecast or predict the future. So now composite indicators now, it's more like an index that tracks those three as one, uh, as one unit. So like as an index, let me put the word index. Okay. It's a summary of the various indicators. I told you which ones they are of the same type into a single value. So if we put them in a single value, then it's like an index. 
you get that all three indicators by three leading lagging and coincident uh, could be calculated as a single composite uh, indicator or an index to benchmark a country's economic performance e.g find a value for a composite leading coincident and lagging indicators right uh, analyze okay we're done with data response so we did those two and now eight mark we have two of these analyze the impact of a devaluation of the rand on the economy well devaluing a rand is um an act by the central bank to reduce the value of its own currency which is the rand <clears throat> so what um impact could that have well we want you to talk about positive impact and then you talk about negative impact so what positive things can happen if a currency is devalued All right exports are cheaper what makes them cheap is that uh foreign nationals will be buying the rand at a lower price but the price did not go down naturally and if it had we wouldn't say devaluation we would say depreciation so in this case is a deliberate act but what why would the central bank do that well the central bank can do that to uh, make our exports cheaper so basically you can see where this could go if our exports are cheaper then that could solve our BOP problems like deficits because foreigners will buy more of South African goods and even South Africans would buy more of South African goods because they would find foreign currency expensive to buy so to import stuff uh, it will be bad okay so all that stuff has to be coming here if it's not there then you might need to add that well they give you that luxury anyway because if you check the memo it would say accept any other relevant facts okay there'll be an increase in the production which will lead to job creation an increase in exports will lead to an improvement in the balance of payments reduces a deficit or actually causing a surplus which is something favorable an increase in the aggregate demand will lead to economic growth and then it allows central banks to cut interest rates which will stimulate the, e the economy then the negatives are it causes inflation which makes uh, imports more expensive this sounds contradictory uh, no no not really because what becomes expensive is imports so yeah it's fine then the next one it reduces the purchasing power of south africans uh traveling abroad abroad which is a bad thing because <clears throat> they want to maybe the reason they are traveling is something that cannot be avoided so now because i'm going to another country i'm not going to enjoy my vacation because you want to devalue my currency it will be something like that <clears throat> it can uh, scare off potential investors because their assets will decrease in value which can result in capital flight as in disinvestment people take their money by people i mean foreign investors debts even even local investors can also you know because local investors have that you know luxury to either invest here or invest abroad so this move by the central bank may chase money away from the country which can then become a problem that's why countries don't normally devalue their currencies but you see china doing it all the time telling the world that you know what we are beating you badly debts in a foreign currency will impact negatively on the cost of repayments that's true we devalue our currency making it weaker we are owing uh, america and we are not going to pay america in rands we are going to pay america in usd so if our currency has become weaker because of our deliberate act paying back that loan will be expensive right then we move on to question number four name any two forms of economic integration well we have the free trade area customs union custom uh, common markets economic union and monetary union what is the focus of the national research and development strategy 
Uh, it focuses on enhanced, enhanced uh, innovation, research in science, engineering and technology, development of human rights or transformation. Right, study the table below and answer the questions that follow. Okay, so this says business cycles, which is successive periods of fluctuations in economic activity, which is caused by endogenous factors. Uh, let's see here, climate uh, conditions um, resulting in droughts. This is from outside. So this is exogenous. Uh, demand and supply policies. Uh, this is a measure to uh, deal with these business cycles then uh, cons uh consumer changing spending patterns this is internal so this is endogenous okay identify the exogenous factors okay i said it already it's a or it's climate condition if you want to write it in full name any one type of business cycle well we have the kitchen we have the juggler we have the kuznets we have the contractive then uh, briefly describe the term business cycle. Well, I did it. I did when we started. I said business cycles are successive periods of fluctuations in economic activity. And the word fluctuate means increase and decrease. So when something is fluctuating, it's going up and down. Why does the endogenous school of thought encourage government intervention in the economy? Because of their belief. Because that's what they believe. The endogenous school of thought believes that markets are inherently unstable. So since they believe that markets are inherently unstable, they think that government intervention is going to bring stability into the economy. So basically that's that. Okay. The next one uh, for four marks, which is the last one, how can the Reserve Bank use demand side policy? Well, the Reserve Bank demand side policy to dampen uh, or, or, or contract the economy. Well, the Reserve Bank has the monetary policy and this policy has the repo rate and it also has money supply. So basically, uh, if um, what the, the Reserve Bank can do is they can be restrictive and them being restrictive means they, uh, they look at the the repo rate and then they increase it and then they look at the money supply they decrease it something like that the reserve bank will use restrictive monetary policy uh, to reduce economic activity or reduce inflation basically they do it like this they increase interest rates they lower down they reduce money supply they use monetary policy to increase the interest rates you see that's what i was saying there increase the interest rate and decrease the money supply and them doing this, they are being restrictive. If the question was talking about the finance minister or the national treasury, uh, I can talk about that then because in the coming years, they could change the same question. And now they replace the reserve bank with uh, national treasury. With that, you'd talk about tax and government spending and being restrictive in this regard it will be increasing tax and reducing government spending. And the opposite of being restrictive is being expansionary. And in some cases, they don't write it as restrictive. In some cases, they'll write it as contractionary. So if you see this term, just know it's meaning the same as restrictive. So your answer is going to talk about the same thing. Okay, so this is what I've been explaining. <clears throat> okay, uh, this term, you saw it in section A, I think, uh, uh, there was uh, a question around this. I, I forgot what the question was saying, but yes, you can rewind, you can go back, or you might remember what it was saying. Okay, right, going to another data response. Which institution or organization encourages free trade? Well, these people, what are they doing? They're saying protectionism costs jobs so these people are complaining about uh any barriers to trade between countries they say open doors the doors that are, they are referring to um borders and then they are voting for free trade they want countries to be able to trade with one another uh they 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 don't want uh tariffs they don't want quotas 
they don't want exchange controls or any other measures uh that will will are, are, are more like what protectionism so basically that's what's going on here let's see which international organization encourages free trade well that would be the world trade organization simple then uh name the term that relates to the worldwide integration of economies that would be globalization the next one briefly describe the term protectionism well protectionism i'd say it's making use of anything that will or any barriers to trade yeah something along those lines a policy that government imposed to protect local producers against unfair eff effects of foreign competition. So governments make, uh, how do they protect themselves? They make use of these things that these people are complaining about. They make use of tariffs. They make use of uh, quotas. And a quota is a restriction on the amount of goods that can be uh, imported. And then they make use of uh, exchange controls, which could be uh, restricting citizens from buying foreign currency so if you are not allowed to buy foreign currency of course people will resort to buying it on the black market uh, which is quite common in countries like zimbabwe yes uh, if you come to south africa it's not as common like you don't see people selling foreign currency uh, on the streets you know you see people selling fruits on the streets not money but in zimbabwe it's a very very common thing so exchange controls will be one of the measures or one of the things that governments do to protect local production so basically that's what protectionism is explain the impact of protection on the value of the rand the rand will appreciate when the exchange rates improve <clears throat> Uh, due to a negative trade uh, balance where protectionism measures were imposed to correct the deficit on the balance of payment. Mm -hmm. How would consumers benefit from a policy of free trade? Well, consumers would enjoy freedom, basically. Uh, they will be able to buy from whoever they can buy from. And also they will benefit because that competition creates lower prices. Uh, purchases products for less yes that's true that's what i'm saying and then welfare is increased so this thing of protectionism is why these people are complaining because they want consumers to be able to get these benefits okay then uh this for eight marks and then there'll be one more eight mark and then we go to the essay this has been one of the longest lessons i've ever made <clears throat> Right. Briefly explain the good governance and investment in social capital as benchmark criteria for regional development. Okay, let's start with good governance. Regional development strategies should be managed effectively and free of corruption. Must be supported by demo democratic decisions, which uh, is not a one-way traffic because democracy means uh, you talk, I listen. As a leader, I do listen to what you say and I consider your say in my final decision. So that's me as a leader being democratic. If a leader is not democratic, then they may be autocratic, uh, which is basically, no, the leader just has the say and you have nothing to say. So, you know, it's a one way traffic thing. I say you do something like that. Okay. Uh, but obviously we have other other cases also where a leader can be what can i say free reign so must be supported by democratic decision making that should not be compromised by nepotism and secrecy uh, or appoint people with uh, correct skills it involves transparency where all role players should be co consulted and then proper financial management and control is essential to meet the aims set by the government then then the last one is investment and take note you get four marks for the first one and four marks for the second one right investment and social in social capital regional development focuses on the principle of of the people for the people by the people 
Development should be addressed from below where most urgent human needs exist. Total development covers all human life, including education, health, and nutrition. All right, the last question in section B, evaluate the success of import substitution as a South African trade policy. Now, if you are evaluating, you might think it was successful or you might think it was not successful. So you have to, uh, but, but then you can just talk about one side. It's possible you get your eight marks. If you have enough points to say it is not successful or it was not successful, but the memo then will cater for different opinions. Okay. So those who would say it is successful or it has been successful. What are your reasons? The first one, promoting initiation and growth of local industries, creating a gap for investment within domestic boundaries, redirecting resources to the uh, production of goods leading to formation of new industries okay so as so on and so on so basically you have all these points uh, if you want to write them down you can pause the video and do so then we also have uh, the reasons why one could think it has not been a success so basically I'll do this as well just go through them and then uh, write them down Right, the last question, which is section C, and again, I'm going with macroeconomics. I'm not even mentioning what they asked with uh, economic pursuits. Discuss the role of markets in the secular flow. So this was enough to make someone pass. How can the business cycle, uh, the business sector contribute more positively to the economy? Well, introduction you may want to define a market like that okay you get your two marks it's not necessarily two points it's one point you get your two marks M moving on to the body so the whole body is uh 26 marks do you notice that the question did not tell you that there is a product market so you knowing that there is the markets they are asking they are talking about here we have one of them being the product market so you tell us what it is uh, basically, I would say it's a market where goods and services are traded. Okay, so in economics, a, distrib a, a distinction is made between goods and services. Okay, so goods are sold, uh, goods are tangible and services are intangible. Basically, that's it. Buying and selling of goods that can be produced in a market. Capital goods, these are goods that are made for, that are not made for their own sake. These are goods that are made to make other goods. Uh, for instance, uh, a sewing machine is not bought for its own sake. It's bought in order to make clothes. Then consumer goods are goods that uh, we buy as consumers to use. And those goods come in three categories. They can be semi-durable. They can be non-durable. They can be durable. Right. Then we have, oh, it's just a continuation. Then services can not be any of that like you cannot have a service that is durable you can't okay services are defined as non-tangible actions and includes wholesale and retail transport and a lot of other things uh flows of private and public goods and services are real flow and they are accompanied by counter flows which are money flow basically Right, then you talk about the factor market, which is a market where goods, where, where factors of production are traded. So land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship are sold on this market. The next one is the financial markets, where uh, basically on the financial markets, personally, I would say um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this consists of banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and the JSE. And with the markets, we have money markets. It's part of the, the, the financial markets there. So a money market is a market where short-term loans, um, okay, let me underline this. So this is what distinguishes money market from capital market, okay? So, and, and take note, by short-term, we mean less than three years, not less than two months, less than three years. So borrowing and lending is done in the short-term, we call it money market. Then we have the, the, the opposite, which is the capital market and the opposite being long-term and long-term meaning more than three years. Okay. 
so basically yeah, individuals and institutions trade financial securities in the long term okay then another market is the foreign exchange market which is a market where one currency can be traded for another okay you can go through this this way you can buy the rand the dollar the pound the euro any currency so it's traded on the foreign exchange market and it's one of the most if not the most volatile market okay and it's global and it's accessible to everyone and prices are not set by anyone it's forces of demand and supply but yes we have other cases when where a currency can be fixed to a commodity or fixed to another currency there are so many uh things involved there so that's a foreign exchange market and then we have the additional part which said how can business the business sector contribute uh more private more positively to the economy well <clears throat> the business sector can contribute more positively to the economy by the following okay so i'm going to do like i did uh that other time so you can just pause and then you uh go through this because this has been a very 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 long lesson and i don't intend to make it any longer than this so here's our conclusion to the essay and so this has brought us to the end of exam prep uh, paper one so i'm going to do exam prep paper two i was planning to do it right away but uh because this lesson has dragged too much uh i i got tired so i'm going to do the other one some other time but maybe by the time you're watching this video they are both up there so you can watch them uh both and uh give me feedback as usual Thank you so much uh, subscribe to the channel comment to the uh, to the channel and um